Over to you, Christiana. Okay. Sure. Well, good evening. And thank you to everyone of you for being here with us today at the Horace's Extraordinary Meeting. Well, I am Christiane Wagner from Art Style Magazine, and it's a great pleasure to chair this channel, this panel on the arts, conscious creativity, and the power to inspire change. With the following speakers, whom I'm glad to welcome. Ariane Phillips, costume designer, fashion editor, and co-founder of Red. Alexis Lubomirsk, photographer and founder of Creatives for Change. Barry White, senior vice president of Christie's. Mark Stevens, art critic and Pulitzer Prize winner. Maya Penn, founder and chief executive officer of Maya's Ideas and Nadia Swarovski, member of the executive board of Swarovski. Well, in this meeting, we will be talking about changing the world for the better through the arts. And uh, well, let's start by contextualizing the ideas. Consider the range of meanings of the arts. We know that the arts transmit our real experience and our imagined ones, stimulating experiences and knowledge in a globalized world. Creativity and technique are the means for the achievement of many innovations and solutions. With this in mind, we would like to know from you, change makers and thinkers, each in your field, what are your ideas and opinions on how to apply creativity consciously and inspire change. We would like to understand how you perceive your reality, even imagined realities, in the socio-cultural context and scene of positive results enabling changes to bring solutions, whether through design, art, photography, art criticism, <coughs> innovation, in general. How these achievements enable new visions? And so, what are your thoughts on this? Well, mm -hmm. please, let's start with Mark Stevens. Well, you set it up with a first question about, um, what was your first question? Tell me your first question again, and then I can answer. Please. Specifically, uh, what are your ideas on opinions on how to employ creativity consciously okay. and inspire change? Yeah. Well, this is a very broad question, obviously, almost impossibly broad. And there are different kinds of creativity to be found in different areas. But I would like to address, to narrow it down, address your question from the particular standpoint of what great art and significant artists can do in this area. Uh, those whom we re who we remember after the battles of the moment have receded and the politics of the moment have changed. Great artists seldom develop in their art an overtly conscious program to inspire social change. They are not usually activists on the front lines of change. They simply aren't. They're too busy in their own way. Uh, they are interested in seeing deeply, thinking deeply, and finding, often unconsciously, deep forms that are powerful and true enough to embody their own personal vision. But that does not mean that such artists cannot in their own way help inspire change. The kind of deep seeing I'm talking about can itself help sustain over the long term social and cultural improvement. The values brought to life inside such art can profoundly affect how a society views and understands itself well beyond the passing parade of fashion and argument. They can give lasting definition to, for example, the last few years in the United States, Black Lives Matter has developed into a powerful movement challenging racial injustice and violence. No one thinks first about art, quote unquote, in relation to this movement. And everyone thinks they know its particular look, don't they? 
images of demonstrations, violence, police, and so on. And yet, this autumn in New York, an extraordinary exhibit opened at the new museum called Grief and Grievance, Art and Mourning in America, that suddenly enriched, illuminated, changed, and deepened what we thought we knew about Black Lives Matter. Uh, by focusing on grief and mourning, its curator, Oguinian Weezer, suddenly opened out the frame in a new way, expanded the frame. Suddenly it was not only rage, injustice, and argument, as important as those things are, but also painfully, sometimes exquisitely beautiful expressions of grief. The curator brilliantly selected the show as well. None of the works made a simple or easy point. They're not didactic arguments or stated positions. They're full of variety of light and shadow. I wish I had time to talk about some of the pieces individually because they were made by serious artists also interested in their craft and many of them could hold our attention in this scattered time. Great art of this kind or significant art of this kind can leave behind inescapable questions. Uh, here, for example, in the show, how can one easily turn away from these powerful expressions and reflections of grief? The reflections must lead, in other words, ultimately to action. Thank you, Mark Stevens. And now we would like to know what Bennett White thinks about this. Please, Bennett. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, Yeah, I, I think I think Mark made a lot of important points, sort of about creativity, many of which I share. And I think that the best art um, that is produced is that art that obviously reflects its time, it reflects back back to us who we are, and hopefully it will help you evolve the way you think about yourself in the world that you live in. Um, and I think that when we think about cultural production in general, um, though we have so far to go, um, there has been a marked interest in a much larger canon, particularly in the last few years, both from a critical um, uh, academic point of view, but also from a market point of view, which is sort of the position that I often come from, um, where there has been an insistence and a necessary insistence on the inclusion of a much larger canon than simply um, the, the, the artists that we have sort of venerated through, through the ages um, to this day. Um, and obviously looking much more seriously at people of color, looking much more seriously at women's um, contributions to the larger art historical canon. And one of the things that's been really fascinating, um, not fascinating is the wrong word, encouraging um, is how are museums specifically responding? Um, and you have seen a massive change in both the curatorial um, pursuit, who museums are, are collecting, and also a serious reevaluation of the collections that they have. And so, though often of late there's been a lot of controversy, controversy around, so the Baltimore Museum had a, a recently, I don't want to say a failed uh, sale, but they decided to pull back. But they have been actually selling works for the purposes of acquiring significantly more diverse holdings. And I think that, again, if we start with this idea of why do we like art? Why do we care about art? Why do we need to make art? Why do we need to engage it, with it? Why do we need to think about it? It is that fundamental thing. Who are we and who do we want to be? You know, And so museums have stepped back um, and said, we need a much broader dialogue. The collecting pop the collector group have stepped back and said, I am not actually understanding the world I live in because the artwork I represent is a tiny sliver and I need to reevaluate that. Um, and I think that the, that that speaks to, and, and obviously those are just two small examples, but I think that speaks to the very powerful way that we understand all of art forms. This is not just simply a visual art form. You know, it, it can it can take whether this is you know great literature, whether it's great painting, whether it's great performance, dance, film, etc., so on and so forth. All of these things inform who we are, and it is 
it is encouraging and inspiring to every day see this dialogue grow, though obviously we are nowhere near where we need to be. Mm -hmm. well, thank you, Barrett. Um, now let's listen to Alexis Lubomirs. So I come at it from it from a different, uh, a little different standpoint in the fact that I'm a, a commercial creative person. Um, I think that uh, I think that you know we are in our lives we are inundated with so much imagery through social media and TV and movies, um, and I think every minute of the day is filled with this subconscious messaging that we creatives are putting out there. Whether you're a photographer, you know, in my I'm in fashion photography and portraits. So whether you're in my business, if you're a photographer, a stylist, a designer. All these creatives, we have incredible power to inspire with our with our uh, with our creativity, and I think it's very important that, especially now, I think now is a, a very fertile time for change. Is that we creatives have to remember that every creative choice that we make sends out ripples, and they can be positive ripples or negative ripples. Um, I think that. Um, it's so important that we recognize our power because a lot of the time we just, I know for myself, you know, you go to work, you try and take a good picture, you try and get a good shoot and then you go home to bed and you have to remember that this will go out into the world and live for years. I mean, I've had the horrific experience going to a dentist and seeing a shoot that I did in a magazine 15 years before. And it's <laughs> well, that's a good thing. So they, never throw away those magazines. Oh, they never throw away those magazines. They never throw away those magazines. I, I threw it away when I, I stole it. Um, <laughs> but and it's it's it reminded me that things that I did 15 years ago they still live on and people look at it and every day we we soak up imagery. I mean every second we're looking at Instagram and, and uh, all these social media outlets and YouTube and we just we take on all this stuff. Um, so I think that. As creatives, we are able to sell an idea. We're, you know, if we suddenly decide that we want to make polka dots fashionable next year, we will inundate all the fashion magazines, all the designs, everything, and we'll make them fashionable. So we do have this incredible power. Um, so I think it's really down to us creatives to start to use our creative power to inspire very. Evolution of the human race, and you know, trying to make things better. And I think it's it's not always easy. I mean, when you when you try and do this, you have to make very difficult choices. But I'm a cheesy old firm believer in the fact that if you if you close the door for the right reason, then another one will open up. So I think it's very important for uh, for us creators to remember that. We also have to remember that our creative voice matters. Um, for example, I worked in a uh, with a, a, a cosmetic company for six years doing their, their campaigns, and you know we every before every shoot we would sit around this big boardroom table and we talk about what the shoot was going to be. It'd be twenty five people, creative directors, and the first time I was there, I would just sit and listen, and I I started to realize that I, as a, when you have a seat at the table, you have to use that position. And so, for example, they would say, you know, we're going to have this supermodel running down New York Fifth Avenue. She's going to be wearing a fur coat because she's wealthy. And another shoot, she's going to be really hot. So she's going to be drinking her Evian bottle of water. And I said to them, listen, millions of girls around the world are going to see this imagery. And they're going to look at this imagery of this beautiful girl running down Fifth Avenue. And they're going to want to buy into that lifestyle. And subconsciously, they're going to want the makeup. They're going to want the hairstyle. They're going to want the fur coat. And they're going to want that plastic bottle of water. And so I said to them, listen, a modern girl wouldn't be wearing a fur coat because she'd be woke and she'd have, eth you know, she'd have ethics and care about animal uh, cruelty. Mm -hmm. And she wouldn't be drinking out of a plastic bottle because she'd be, uh, she, you know, she cares about the planet. And so we took those things out just because I said it. Now, it seemed like a very small thing, but afterwards you think about these, as I said, 15 years later, you're going to find these images somewhere. And... By just by these small movements in our creative choices, we can make vast change. Well, thank you, Alexi. 
And now also Maya Penn's ideas are welcome. Hi. Hi, thank you so much. I apologize for joining late. Um, I had to switch to a completely different device because Run the World was lagging on my other laptop. So just, uh, I don't know if everyone's done introduction, um, but my name is Maya Penn. I'm a 21 year old sustainable fashion designer. I am also an animator and filmmaker, as well as a Simon Schuster author. I've given three TED Talks, which have been translated into 30 different languages and have gone uh, viral worldwide. And I'm also a sustainability consultant and an environmental activist. And, you know, my work has always really centered on environmental and social good. I've always, you know, been a multidisciplinary artist who's wanted to use art to drive conversations forward, to raise awareness about causes that are important to me. I started out in 2008, actually when I was eight years old, I started my sustainable fashion brand, Maya's Ideas. Um, and then while that was happening, I was also, you know, I've always been very passionate about animation and I started making my own animated short films by the time I was like seven and eight years old, making digitally animated short films. Um, by the time I was 13, I started premiering clips of those animated series during my talks, during my TED talks. And they've all surrounded, um, you know, either environmental or social issues. I have a production company called Dependo Productions, and I focus specifically on speaking to those topics. For example, I've worked with um, Adobe and Luna Bars and Lean In to create content around Women's History Month, Women's Equal Pay, um, and also for uh, Hulu and Attention, a series that's on Hulu called Your Attention Please, which highlights the voices of black artists, activists, entrepreneurs. And, you know, my story was also featured in an animated segment that I worked on for that. And as of right now, I'm currently working on an animated short film that's really featuring environmental topics. And, you know, that's something that I'm currently doing fundraising for right now. But my goal with my production company is not just to make content that will raise awareness around environmental and social good issues, but to also use that as a way to help uh, empower marginalized artists as well. So when I'm working on these larger projects, you know, I'm specifically looking for, you know, women, black, brown and indigenous artists and animators in the industry to collaborate with as well. And, you know, in 2016, I think I really fully understood the power of art um, when I was 16 years old. This was during the Obama administration. I was commissioned to animate the opening of the first ever digital report that was presented to Congress. And so this was to get an American Museum of Women's History built in Washington. I went to the Capitol. Um, and it was the anim- opening of the report that I had animated at 16 years old was presented to congressmen and women um, and also to you know, President Obama the next day as well. And, you know, as of this year, which is some exciting news, that legislation has actually been passed through an omnibus spending bill. And so now there actually will be an American Museum of Women's History built um, there that uh, that legislation to have you know access to the space to be able to build that museum that's been passed. So that's really exciting because, you know, that's something that hasn't been highlighted, the contributions of women, you know, to uh, American history and and innovation. So I I think that, you know, my work has wholeheartedly been centered on the power of art to move forward, environmental and social change. And I think that art is a tool to make information more accessible to people. You know, there are a lot of, as an activist, there are a lot of spaces like sustainability or, you know, sustainability or you know, it could be the, the gender pay gap or it could be, you know, racial justice. You know, that can be very complex for many people. And that can, you know, sometimes even be, uh, you know, purposefully confusing for a lot of people. And so I think that art is the perfect medium to use to, you know, help bring people into these kind of conversations so they can be informed, so they can be aware and so they can know how they want to do good in the world. Um, as well. And, you know, kind of breaking down complex issues through creative mediums is something that I've always been very passionate about. So 
that's kind of what I would add. Wonderful. Oh, that's fine. Thank you, Maya. Thank you very Thank much. You. Well, let's see what Nadia Svarov has to bring it to the meeting. Please, Nadia. Well, I have to say it's great to be here and it's been so fantastic to listen to everyone and hear everyone's point of view. So uh, my contribution here is from my point of view, which is really kind of the jewelry industry. But um, And I, I've always taken my inspiration from my great-great-grandfather who started the company Swarovski in Austria, but with the inspiration to give every woman the feeling of what it feels like to wear a crystal, I mean, to wear a diamond. So he created the ultimate crystal cutting machine and made that material that felt like a diamond very affordable. So his kind of sense of wanting to empower women uh, was always a driver for the company and certainly is a driver for myself um, in my work at Swarovski. And um, it's been just, I mean, for me, jewelry, um, the jewelry industry, the fashion industry, the art industry, architecture, these are all platforms of creativity. They are platforms of communication and storytelling to the end consumer. So, Alexi, to your point, we have to, if we're in the position of creating these means, we have to be so consciously aware of what is the messaging that we are communicating. And yet we are in the position to communicate a very positive message. And... Um, you know, I just wanted to say again, as Mark was saying, you know, art is so much a reflection of the zeitgeist and so is jewelry and so is fashion. And it was Swarovski, it's been so fascinating to witness that, you know, over the last century, whether it was, for example, the flapper era, when the role of the woman changed in society, you know, women cut their hair, women did sports, women started to smoke. But in particular, lack of hair meant there was more room for adornment on the neckline. So jewelry really played a huge role there. Um, so did the beads in, you know, the, the costumes that allowed for free flowing and expression. Then again, we have the Art Deco era, you know, it was very industrial. The architecture was very large and uh, substantial. And so really was um, the expression within jewelry. Our product was perfect. You know, the geometric shapes of the crystal really reflected that. And then we move on to the style icons, Coco Chanel, Christian Dior, when fashion became more individual and suddenly a designer's name was attached to fashion. And all these designers had a very strong means of wanting to express a message. I mean, we all know the story of Coco Chanel. She was so strong and powerful and determined and became a very strong role model to her customers and women in the industry. Um, so, you know, we've really tried to tap into that um, eventually with the creation of the jewelry line called Atelier Swarovski. So there really, as you were saying, Maya, we've really tried to embrace the world of sustainability. And what we really tried to prove is that, you know, as you're manufacturing, you can manufacture in a very sustainable way. You just need to look at the supply chain and clean it up. So. Full chemicals. And then we've also fast forwarded <clears throat> to really becoming a storyteller within the jewelry. So um, we've tapped into designers that really stand for something. So for example, the last collection was by Susan Rockefeller, who is a big nature uh, conserver, and as well as Penelope Cruz, who has a very strong voice in the sustainability arena, as well as Catherine Prevo. She's very connected to the conservation fund. And their collections are all about flora and fauna. And then proceeds of those collections go to the Nature Conservancy or various different funds. So we feel like we're telling a story through the jewelry, we're providing a beautiful product, and we're shedding light on those organizations who are trying to contribute positively um, to the environment. So, and then we fast forwarded that. We have also then started to create um, fine jewelry with created diamonds which at this point are a little bit more environmentally friendly than the extraction of real diamonds from the earth. Although I have to say the diamond industry is trying very hard to become more sustainable. And I would like to commend those efforts. And it just shows you it is doable. You know, companies like Tiffany's are definitely demonstrating that sustainability is something to be embraced here. Um, and then... And for example, the, the metal that we're using is fair trade gold. We work with a tiny little mine in Peru, and that really taps into 360 uh, circular economy. The miners are actually alpaca farmers that just happen to sit on a gold mine. 
you know, so by actually using their gold, they're able to take care of their local community. And all of that, it just requires a bit of research and you can just really connect the dots. Plus the consumer feels really excited that they're contributing to a bigger picture while having a beautiful product. And we call that um, conscious luxury. And the last thing I just wanted to mention in terms of, again, back to values and the power of creation, namely the positive power of creation. We had such a beautiful example, um, which I'm sure you've all seen, which is the star at Rockefeller Center. It's the Christmas star of Rockefeller Center, which Swarovski has been creating for the last 15 years. And the last two years, it was created by the Jewish architect, my dear, dear friend, Daniel Liebeskind. And I thought it was really exciting to have a Jewish architect create the Christmas star you know, and really emphasize the message. This day and age, no, it's not about religion, it's about values. And his message about that star was a message of hope, uh, a message of, ha of, ha of faith. And suddenly, you know, our borders are breaking down and things are becoming more universal. So um, we really wanted to tap into those values. Um, another, one last example I wanted to share with you is um, we created an installation with the Burelik brothers, wonderful designers in Paris. It was the fountains. The next time you are in Paris, please check out these fountains. There are five fountains around, around Champs-Élysées. They're implementing crystal, water, LEDs. And what was so fascinating about that installation, it is an installation for the public. And we put up that installation one week after um, the red vest were vandalizing the stores and the Swarovski store, for example, was absolutely vandalized. And we were really worried, should we do this very valuable installation or not? And we went ahead and did it because it worked for the public and it wasn't touched. You know, it was so beautiful. It was so valuable, but I think subconsciously people could feel the intention of these designers, which was such a kind intention. It was giving to the city, giving to the public and the appreciation was there. So, the subconscious message um, and the, the, the storytelling is so important. And um, I think we're all waking, we've woken up this last year and I think there's a greater consciousness and it's gonna be so exciting to see what's going to happen in that art space in general. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, well, to close this first round, you, you are going to now to call Erin Phillips. Hi. Um... All right. Well, there's so much to say on this, right? I'm super inspired to listen. Maya, um, what you've accomplished is just amazing and so inspiring, and we have to connect afterwards. Um, and Alexi, thank you for inviting me and for what you're doing with uh, taking the pledge. Alexi asked me, so I'm a fashion designer, I'm sorry, fashion editor and a costume designer. And um, basically, uh, yeah, uh, Lexi has created a program where he's asked other creatives in the industry to take pledges uh, based on what we're comfortable with around uh, using animal skins and furs. And uh, I think it's really, really wonderful. And uh, I was happy to join the Lexi in that. And that was a really wonderful way to uh, change a conversation across uh, creatives. Um, for me, um, everything really kind of came to a head in 2016 um, when the election happened and uh, my personal bubble um, popped and um, a girlfriend of mine and I um, were just really frustrated. We, you know, we, of course, we were, we, we went and we marched and we did everything, you know, we just felt like everything was on the line, including, you know, truth, uh, everything was being questioned and um, that we really had to do something and, and what could that be? And I... ...speaking to each other and using our platforms for good is really, really inspiring. And mm -hmm. what could I do to change the conversations with other creatives in the industry for instance being on a film set talking to an actor talking you know people who have platforms mm -hmm. and have reach where um you know at, at events public events like film premieres or award shows where millions and millions of eyeballs are focused on uh you know uh, people who are and everyone's using their platform to communicate their values and generationally 
um, Maya's generation is demanding it. We want, you know, w you know what products we're buying, mm -hmm. who we're supporting, what movies are going to see. You know, we want to brands have to communicate their values. So for uh, my friend and I, um, we, my friend Karina Martin and I, we created this concept of RAD, which is red carpet advocacy. And the idea of changing the conversation between creatives, bringing together elements across industries from uh, the Swarovskis, from the brands to the talent and how we can come together, whether it's on the red carpet or in a fashion magazine, to communicate our values and do and for social good. And we really believe that supporting talents, um, meaning um, artists' uh, causes and nonprofits and their beliefs is really great is the has the most leverage because of their millions of fans and followers and so we help talent raise money and awareness it were really an advocacy platform for uh what's important to them and to help communicate their values simultaneously when we were ideating this um i was invited to a very early times up room and um was asked you know a, a lot of times i think we feel powerless or we can't make a difference. And I was asked in that Time's Up room if I could create something for the, um, it was a, in this meeting, it was talked about that the, uh, about the Golden Globes, that the actresses were going to have a show of solidarity and all wear black. And could I create something as a costume designer and a fashion stylist, create something for the men to wear? And that was like a eureka moment for me simultaneously. I was having these conversations about, how we can create um, uh, this, you know, rad, uh, this uh, create good across the industry. And this really was the impetus to do something to take my expertise and my relationships and use it towards progress to something good. So along with a friend of mine who Nazan knows very well, Michael Schmidt, we created a pin, the Time's Up pin that became the logo. And um, we saw on the red carpet how that really, at the Golden Globes with that Time's Up roll-up, roll-out, how that really inspired change and created new conversation and community on the red carpet, how we can use these platforms for promotion and infuse purpose. And that's really um, what has given me sustainability for being a creative in a commercial industry. The idea that I can come together with other creatives mm -hmm. and talk about what's important to you, what causes, what charities, what um, awareness. And we mm -hmm. have partnered um, with RAD, everything from Future Coalition is an environmentally based um, organization with people you probably know, Maya, you're nodding your head. Um, you know, across uh, across almost every, we did a, a massive uh, campaign actually with Christie's Bennett and Mark Seliger auction for COVID relief, raised over a quarter million dollars uh, during COVID for good um, for 19 different COVID charities. And the reason why it was different COVID charities is because each artist whose portrait Mark Seliger had taken we partnered with them to raise money for their charity. So giving a voice, you know, um, artists in this industry are constantly promoting other people's brands, uh, you know, even their own, even their own films, they're, they're promoting it for the studios. So being able to partner with talent and help them raise money and awareness for causes and charities that are important to them not only is great in terms of visibility and the advocacy, but um, you have this emotional connection to something that's, it's not agenda driven. It's truly who the artist supports. So it's been really, in, you know, it's cha it's given me my own personal sustainability for staying in a commercial industry that as Alexi knows well, um, we have to navigate people's agendas every day and, you know, all kinds of, uh, marketing. So being able to come together, not only with talent, but with brands for progress. And, you know, in the era of COVID and the social justice movement this year, we've seen all kinds of, of, of brands make proclamations, you know, standing with Black Lives Matter and 
but what are people doing? So coming together with other creatives to help move and change that conversation and brands helping um, align with that. It's been really great. It's been, um, you know, uh, every day is, is a new opportunity for us. And I think for me, um, being able to have those conversations with other creatives and how we can move the needle together and the advocacy component, not just the donations, but creating community in an industry where we often, you know, uh, I have artist friends who are working solo or, you know, you're working in um, a commercial environment. It's It's been really, really gratifying. And, uh, and uh, the conversations that we're having now, it's like this year has has turned us upside down. And now everybody is looking to figure out how to have, um, you know, insert values into their life. What can we do to, to make a difference? How can we come together, whether it's creatively, but in every aspect in our lives? And I think that we have a responsibility as creatives to lead that conversation and um, infuse purpose into uh, what we do already organically. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you, Ariane. Now, now we are going to get you focus on ethics, aesthetics, and innovation, and think about your thoughts, your idea, ideas. Now, let's put this in context. From the 20th century to our days, social transformation have emerged, leading to changes. That's what the creativity embedded in the arts is the energy that allows humans to come up with innovative ideas that you lead to such changes. When we look at the climate crisis you, we are facing right now, innovation is not only welcome, but is probably indispensable. Even if we had to really change our lifestyle, we won't come out with this without technical innovations. Can we come from these fields that deal with creativity, creativity Board, that innovative solutions will be found, or is everything a little more complicated than that? Please, my students' thoughts are well appreciated concerning this context. Well, let, let me first say that I enjoy luxury and fashion and um, consumerism of all kinds, um, but I also think that. Um, I may be a little miscast here because I think art needs to uh, rigorously attack the culture of luxury and um, of uh, uh, excess grotesque uh, materialism. That is really what art uh, should be doing now in terms of what you're talking about, Christian. Um, now, it, there's two ways you can do that. There, there's one, one thing that artists can do is they can they can show examples, they can create fantastic examples of grotesque excess. For example, Damien Hirst's Skull of Diamonds, you might remember about 15 years ago or so, he, uh, he created this uh, uh, a skull that was encrusted with 8,000 flawless diamonds that an investment group then bought for $100 million. Now, I'm not a great fan of Damon Hurst often. I mean, I think he suffers from the problems he criticizes, he himself. But uh, at the same time, it's an absolutely fantastic image of grotesque, uh, beautiful ostentation, right? I mean, it is a banner image of, of many of the things that are wrong in our society and that artists can expose as wrong in that way. That's one thing they can do. There's another guy whose image I really like, a, a, an artist named Loss, Tom Lawson, I think his name is. He did thousands and thousands, this is a, again about the same time, quite a few years ago, thousands and thousands of, uh, of cell phone chargers that had been thrown away. And they were all in this uh, great vast field. And they looked like, a, a, it's quite beautiful, a writhing nest of, of black snakes that was going to consume you even as we consume them, right? I mean, as we consume and consume and consume, and in, in this new digital age too, we create snakes, really. And we throw them away and they're eventually gonna eat us. That was sort of the feeling of it. And so artists can, can, can do that. They can open a window into what we're doing wrong and wastefully. 
That's one thing. They, another thing they can do is they can create an alternative. And this is, in, in a way, what interests me more. Um, design is really, really important. And design is, uh, is, is uh, disvalued and disrespected too often in our culture. It's thought to be a lesser art, and it's thought to be uh, a, a luxury. You know, for example, only wealthy people have architects. Only wealthy, only fancy buildings have architecture. Otherwise, they're just thrown up, right, just to make money. Well, design can do something very, very different. Um, uh, it can create an alternative world where there is not this waste and where there is not this kind of grotesque consumerism. You can create worlds through the imagination that designers can make this, artists can make this too, uh, that uh, are environments that we might want to live in, that are better environments, that are not so wasteful. And governments and societies ought to be putting major resources towards design. I mean, in New York City, for example, I, I'm always walking into the subways and I'm always amazed at how badly designed subway entrances are, uh, that you just can't use them properly. Now, partly that's because back when they didn't think about it, but they've, they've never thought about it. Even the new ones are not so good. <laughs> and it's important to think about how we design the environment. And that is something that we can really, really do to help. I think, I mean, if only there would be uh, some, some visionary people kind of like the Bauhaus uh, in the 1920s and 30s. Um, they were working with a new mechanical industrial world and they had a vision for how to make that world serve people's actual needs. Now, if we could have designers and architects begin to think about how to, to serve people's needs in a useful way in our new digital environment, how to deal with all the effing plastic in the ocean, all to, to do all these things, think in an intelligent way about how to organize space well, that would be a great thing to do. So that is a positive way to to think about what the arts can contribute. And there's, but then there's also that critical way that that uh, that exposing what's wrong. So that's my thought on that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much, Omar. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, we have almost reached the end of our meeting. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> but on the wall, the battle is out. Uh, what prevails is progress and the will to create new techniques, research, methods, and novelties, a solution for many situations. And uh, to be open to new experience for the sake of creativity and knowledge. In this way, if the rules are not good enough, we can try to innovate and make them better. Okay? And that's my message for today. And to finish our panel, I would like to know your main point, our take-home message very quickly, because we have, we have only two minutes. Yeah. And you are 30 seconds each. Okay, perfect. Can you write your message, please? Sorry. So my 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 gosh, can I can I can I pass the buck to somebody else for the first message? And I promise to come back. You go, please. So I just want to quickly touch. But I'll be thirty seconds. I want to touch on what you said about the the the, the comment about luxury. I think you are absolutely right. I think art is supposed to sort of comment on the the excess of luxury. But I think we have to reimagine what the word luxury means because luxury is something that you don't necessarily need that you want and stuff like that. But where, for example, Nigel was talking about conscious luxury, which I think should be the new word. And then it's our job as creative to then push this conscious luxury. You know, we don't need furs ripped off a, for an animal's back. We don't need blood diamonds. We don't need all this stuff that causes harm to other people. So we've got to create this conscious luxury. And then we as creatives have to push it out there and just inspire people to live better and wonderful. I'll say uh, here, 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 Alexi. I encourage people to think about how to infuse purpose and progress into the work that they do organically already. Showing and communicating your values were only more, you know, of course, this is the, the description of being an artist, of course, but in the commercial arts, in fashion, in film, in, uh, with brands, you know, communicating your purpose and your values is going to emotionally connect you to your audience. Absolutely. Great. Can I say something? Did it to everyone. And I just wanted to say what's uh, absolutely 
crucial in this arena is education. So really embracing the design schools, working with them to actually start thinking in a sustainable way, yet beautiful way. There's never a compromise, you know, so uh, to be sustainable doesn't mean you're not luxurious or beautiful or meaningful. So I think to really embrace that young generation to create things that are sustainable and to be able to give back, really important. Thank you. On Maya? Yeah, so I've actually been a sustainability consultant. I've worked with startups. I've worked with Fortune 500 companies. And, you know, I think what's really necessary is to know that sustainability, social good, diversity, and all of these different topics should be the new norm. They should be the new standard of, of business across all industries. And, you know, to really focus in biomimetic design, biomimicry, which is basically using nature as the original innovator and the original, you know, innovator for art, which is something that can span across so many different uh, industries. Mm -hmm. and so I think that, you know, we really need to, you know, be bold and you know,